Hi folks, we're back with lecture number six on popular culture during the Gilded Age or the late 19th century. We've already discussed some of the effects of industrialization taking place near the turn of the century. The rapid pace of technological innovation, the rise of labor movements, and more. Now we need to turn to American culture in general during the period. For instance, how did people relax? What did they do in their leisure time? Or did anybody even have any leisure time to enjoy? Well, increasingly, the answer to these questions was yes. They did have time to enjoy hobbies and pastimes. Why do I say that? Because we have the rise of the white-collar business world during this period. The term blue-collar job typically means a trade or something that someone does uh, directly, such as a steel worker or a plumber. The phrase white-collar job typically refers to a job that's done in an office environment. Think about department store clerks or workers in an accountant's office or a doctor's office. And the working hours of those in the white-collar world were typically 8 to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. In other words, they these white-collar jobs tended to be uh, eight-hour jobs as opposed to many industrial jobs during the era which were still you know 10-hour days, 12-hour days. And so for these stenographers or telephone operators, many of which were women by the way during this period, uh, they go home at the end of the day at 5 p.m. They go home to spend time with their families. Or if you're a physician or an accountant, uh, you don't work on the weekends typically, so you also have time on the weekends to pursue pastimes. And even in the blue-collar world, we see the, the working day getting shorter over time due to union protests. For example, the United Mine Workers Union won an eight-hour workday in 1898. So with workdays gradually shrinking and people having more time off, even paid holidays, then folks do have the ability to pursue leisure activities. What about money? Well, we talked about the rise in real income during the late 19th and early 20th century. As the price of many basic goods starts to go down due to mass production techniques, people have a little bit more spare change to pursue hobbies. So what are people doing for fun? Traditional pastimes remained incre incredibly popular. These included going to see a theatrical performance, going to see a play, events involving the performance of music. Uh, so we start to see symphony orchestras popping up in cities such as San Francisco or New York or Chicago. Remember, before the advent of radio, the only way you heard music is as, you, is if you were physically in the same room as a musician. Alongside these tried-and-true amusements, though, new, non-traditional hobbies began to spring up based on new technology. The sport of bicycling, for instance, developed with the introduction of a smaller, safer, more maneuverable version of the existing two-wheeler. You can see the early versions of bikes uh, did not look all that comfortable. They had this huge front wheel, this tiny little back wheel. If you fell off of this thing, you might risk breaking an ankle. Some of the earliest versions of these unwieldy bicycles had no brakes. So that's not the definition of fun, is going out and risking your life. By the 1880s, however, we have the introduction of the so-called safety bicycle, where the front wheel is shrunk down, the back wheel is enlarged to the same size. You have two wheels of the same size. You are now lower and closer to the ground, meaning that if, should you fall off, there's less risk of personal injury. And as the price of these once luxury items begins to go down, it means many more Americans will begin bicycling as an exercise, bicycling as a hobby on the weekends. It allowed housewives who worked inside the home to escape the confining radius of their domestic existence. It allowed teenagers to sneak off to the park and meet their sweetheart. The bicycle was a portable, relatively cheap, and convenient mode of transportation. In the end, the bicycle was embraced with such enthusiasm by Americans during the Gilded Age that several hit songs were written about the two-wheeler, including A Bicycle Built for Two and I Love You, Bicycle and All. 
Another pastime that developed after mid-century for the middle class was participation in dog shows, the selective breeding of certain types of canines, and also pet ownership begins to increase, uh, not just among the middle class, but among the working class. Today, we are accustomed to the idea that, that you have pets in your home, but that was really a luxury that only the wealthy could afford for much of human history. Dogs might be kept around, but they didn't come inside the home. We didn't shampoo them and put rhinestone collars on them. For much of human history, dogs were there as a security system, and you might throw them a few bones every now and then, but they were not pampered pets the way we think of them today. That changes during the late 19th century. As the working class and the middle class aspire to be like their wealthier counterparts, they began adopting pets. We also credit the Gilded Age as an era in which many of the first modern board games were created. For instance, one of the predecessors to a very popular modern-day board game appeared around the turn of the 20th century, the Landlord's Game, as creator Elizabeth McGee dubbed it in 1904, was based on economic principles and was designed to teach players about property ownership. You can see uh, the board here on the slide for the Landlord's Game. What does it remind you of? Monopoly. As tourism and travel became more affordable in the late 1800s, with railroad lines crisscrossing the country and steamships regularly making trips between the East Coast and Europe, companies also began to create board games that appealed to American travelers. When families returned from their trips, they could relive their journey by playing games such as Around the World with Nellie Bly. Or, more likely, for those of more modest means, those who could not afford to travel, this was a way to travel vicariously. To play one of these games and to travel to Malta or to Algeria or some of these exotic locales, places you would never be able to actually afford in real life, was interesting to them. Or playing the landlord's game, later the game of Monopoly, this was a way for you to become a real estate tycoon, when in reality you might be stuck as a renter for your actual existence. Well, just as some Americans were beginning to travel abroad in large numbers during the period, so too were many visiting places within the United States. And one huge draw for many Americans was the Columbian Exposition, held in the city of Chicago in 1893. This was a World's Fair designed to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's voyage to the New World, hence its name. There were countless railroad lines that terminated in Chicago, many of them coming in from the Midwest and the Far West, because Chicago was the center of the meatpacking industry or the slaughterhouse industry in the United States. So that with these existing rail lines, it was fairly cheap for many Americans from areas across the country to simply converge on the city of Chicago. And there was a lot of fanfare associated with the Columbian Exposition or the Chicago World's Fair. The size of this event was huge. It cost over half a billion dollars in today's currency for these exhibits to be erected. The size of the fairgrounds were uh, uh, spanned across almost 700 acres and featured 65,000 exhibits. People went here to see a glimpse of the future. There were technology halls that, that showed some of the latest gadgets uh, and offered the promise for a better future through innovation. People also flocked to the Chicago World's Fair as a way of traveling abroad. Because it's a World's Fair, you have many other countries that are actively participating and send in uh, people to participate in some of these recreations of villages from around the world. For working class Americans, this was as close as they would get to traveling abroad. They might visit a little recreation of a German village, or they might pass through a Japanese village, and they might hear those languages being spoken by representatives sent from those countries. On the periphery of the exhibition areas was an amusement area that also provided entertainment opportunities. There, visitors could catch a ride on the Ferris wheel, which made its debut in Chicago that year. Or there were some adult entertainments in the amusement area, where one belly dancer known as Little Egypt created a scandal by performing a suggestive dance while scantily clad. There's a photo here of Little Egypt, and by today's standards, this is a modest costume. Uh, but the fact that her belly was exposed, her arms were exposed, that did not happen 
during the late Victorian era. Women were supposed to be covered up. Even a f the flash of, uh, of skin on a woman's ankle was considered to be scandalous. Other cheap amusements for the working class and middle class were so-called dime novels. These were cheap, mass-produced works of fiction, and they took their name for the price. Uh, many of these novels were five cents or ten cents, hence the term dime novel. The most popular genres that Americans were reading were westerns, romance novels, or detective stories. Unfortunately, many of these dime novels reinforce some incredibly negative stereotypes. Racial stereotypes, stereotypes of certain religious groups, were reinforced in uh, these cheap publications. For example, you can see Secret Service was among one of the more popular serial dime novels of the age, and you can see the representation here of the Chinese. Uh, they're busting into a opium parlor and uh, seeing that white women there had been enslaved. These were a terrible negative stereotypes that, as I said, were really perpetuated uh, during this era through these, these cheap books. But could people read? Well, increasingly we are seeing, even among the working class, literacy rates steadily climbing during the late 19th century. As public school systems get up and running uh, by the 1840s and 1850s in the north and then a little bit later by the 1870s and 1880s in the south, we will start to see that Americans are becoming increasingly more literate. And at, we'll see an explosion of printed media as a result. Newspapers go into wide circulation during this period. Social magazines uh, where people could read about the lives of the wealthy were incredibly popular in addition to dime novels. We will see that companies will begin sinking huge amounts of money into advertising their wares in all of this new printed media, from newspapers to magazines and the like. Competition among businesses for the American consumer dollar meant that they had to create ad campaigns that were memorable. They had to make their brand of flour stand out, for example, against that of their competitors. We'll also see the use of mail order catalogs. Sears Roebuck and Company started out as a mail order catalog company where you didn't go to a store, the store came to you in your mailbox. Uh, and you could browse through one of these catalogs and you could order things, you could send in a check, and then several weeks later you would receive your merchandise, usually via a nearby rail line. The only way this works, though, is if people can read the catalogs. So the mail order industry explodes during this period with rising literacy rates. Other forms of cheap traditional amusements included uh, going ice skating if you lived in a climate in which it was cold enough to do so. Uh, playing team sports. This is the era in which baseball really becomes America's game. The, with the expansion of railroads, you'll see traveling theater troops. So now, uh, if you didn't live near a big city, then sometimes you could go to a nearby performance of a Shakespearean skit. Or you might have um, Wild West shows, like Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. It would travel to your neighborhood via the railroads, and uh, that was a cheap uh, easy amusement. As baseball became a much more popular sport, quite naturally black athletes wished to compete. However, given the sad state of race relations in the United States, black athletes and fans were turned away from the National League. They were forced to branch out on their own and create the so-called Negro Leagues. These all-black baseball leagues featured teams from cities across the country, such as the Chicago American Giants or the New York Homestead Grays. New technology based on electricity also changed Americans' pastime activities as they will go to early moving pictures and they will go to amusement parks powered by electricity, so the Ferris wheel at Coney Island, for example. Other technologies such as telephones allow people to contact family members and friends to host parties much more easily than before. But let's also keep in mind the price of all of this technological change. Coal-fired power plants were belching out huge amounts of particulate matter into the atmosphere during this period. Chemical manufactories were dumping excess chemicals into water sources. As the railroads expanded, they were not only bringing in vaudeville acts or Wild West shows to your town, they were bringing in more pollution. So all of this new technology came with a high environmental cost during the Gilded Age.